Next idea, I gotta show you. Uh, this is the South Bronx. These are kids, uh, get rid of that one. These are kids, as I said, in one of the toughest neighborhoods in the United States. No one should grow up in this kind of place, but they do. So what's gonna happen here is, um, it turns out one of the most difficult skills to teach in our school system is writing. Very, very difficult. And it's particularly difficult for certain populations, middle school minority males. Very tough. Certain populations really struggle with writing. So what I want to do is show you a writing environment that I think has a good enough to criticize capacity compared to lots of other things I see. First of all, these are New York City poets, and they're sitting in Manhattan. They are not going to the South Bronx. They're staying where it's safe. And what they're going to do is they're going to hear students reciting poetry. My name is Geraldine Reynoso, and my poem is called Darkness. Uh, all, there's three poems here that I've cut out. And this is a standard class. These aren't special kids. They're 12 years old. Every single child uh, is the child of immigrants. Everyone. And the unfortunate part of this video is the content is very violent and sad. Every poem. Will I live? Will I die? I mean, it's just, it's heart-wrenching stuff. Sometimes I ask myself the, like, the hardest questions, whether it be rhetorical or just out of the ordinary. I jump rope in situations that make me think, so I struggle in my mind. When in the midst of hatred and confusion, I toss and turn to catch on my thoughts, thinking of ways to run through my visions of perfection. My fury and anger spills out in front of me, so now everyone sees the true me. I see life as it's tilting before my eyes, like time is taking its toll on me. My ego blinds my sight to see the truth, something I sometimes hesitate to see. In my situation, the process of elimination is never settled. Just pointing at time, when time points at me, I listen to my own echoes as I see a dark, gloomy picture with no captions. The press sinks down to my veins and my legs refuse to walk. As I close in on the problem, the scenery changes. Okay, how they do it? If you ask this boy to take a piece of paper and a pen, he becomes paralyzed. He can't just start writing. If you give him a computer screen, it's the same as the blank. It's just blank. But the boy can talk well. He can speak well. So what they do is they take a video camera, and they just have him stand up and just talk. What are your ideas? So now he has video. So he takes the video, and he watches it immediately. This is important. He watches it immediately, and he starts taking notes of what he spoke into the camera. And then he makes a draft of those notes and he, and he starts to read that into the camera and goes back. So they start with video to get to writing. Do so he takes the video home. Now he has something he can take home. He takes the video home, puts it in at home, and at home he continues to work on his poem by listening to his own voice. If you believe in equity, this has got to happen. Don't debate this. Okay, so he's going back and forth between video and writing, and then finally the teacher, who I was just a, had a pleasure talking to, is very clear. He says, look, if we don't have the authentic audience, right in Manhattan, remember the po poets, if we don't have the authentic audience, they're not completely motivated. So to put all the pieces together, oh, one more little detail. Um, in the video, they teach the boy to turn off the visual and only listen to his voice. Then they teach him to turn off the audio and only watch him as he talks. So they're teaching him to get one channel of feedback at a time. And when you can break things down for kids into one channel of feedback, you can help more kids. Are you okay? Or any of you using video to teach 
traditional writing? No. One, you are. Yeah? Is it going? Is it? You did. I did. No, no more? It didn't work? Uh, the administration didn't like it. Administration didn't like it. I'm, for those of you whose administrators, are there any administrators in the room? I mean, <laughs> you know, for those of you who are administrators, I know that you're not his administrator, um, so I know you're different and you would allow your teachers to do this, right? You would encourage them. Okay. I am convinced that we are underutilizing technology in our schools. I am convinced that we essentially have the same culture we had in 1922. That we've bolted technology on top of old assignments. No real change. And the real change is the shift of control. That's the change. A shift of control to students to manage more of their own learning. A shift of control to the family to have access to more information than they ever did through the use of video in this case. We're going to shift control. For those of you who are leaders, I think that's the essential question leaders should be asking as they walk around their schools. Are we using technology to liberate people, to be self-directed, self-motivated, and to take more control over managing their own learning. I'm convinced the most important question to ask is who should own the learning? You agreed that currently the government owns the learning. Was that the number one? Government owns the learning. And that you agreed that students should own the learning. Wasn't that the, the second result? All right, so clearly, in this room, you now believe that the government owns the learning even though students should own the learning. Okay, I think we can allow for no child left behind and shift control to the students to own more of their own learning. All right, listen, I, I hope it was good enough to criticize. And uh, I just want to thank the folks at Promethean for giving me absolutely free reign to antagonize some of the brightest people in the country. <laughs> so thank you to Promethean for that. Yay. Thank you, Sonny. So it's been an honor. I'm going to clean up here and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.